Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. Hello, hello, hello. So thrilled to be with you guys tonight. Thanks for joining us. We have a wonderful show coming up. We are going to be joined by not one guest, but two guests. And then after the stream, you can meet me and Colin, which is the, the chat that I do following my live streams. That's a free app that you can find uh, the link to in the description. And that's a free app. You just use your phone and you get to call in and ask me questions. So who are we speaking to tonight? Well, let me just remind you before we bring them in that, of course, we really appreciate your liking the stream, subscribing to the channel, hitting subscribe, and then hitting the bell so you never miss a stream or you never miss clips. This is a really important show that we're doing tonight, so we want to make sure that people can uh, see this, and the way you can help with that is by sharing it and, again, subscribing and liking. That just helps with the algorithm. and. If you want extra content, uh, I did a great interview with Kit Clarenberg. You can access that at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. But again, really do appreciate your support in subscribing and liking and supporting the Patreon and all of that because we want to make sure that we get these stories out there, especially since they are, as we saw recently, often censored. So today's show, I'm going to be talking to Nura Erekat. And Miko Pellet. And Nura is a human rights attorney and associate professor at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, in the Department of Africana Studies and the Program in Criminal Justice. She is an editorial committee member of the Journal for Palestine Studies and a co founding editor of Jadalaya, an electronic magazine on the Middle East that combines scholarly expertise and local knowledge. She is the author of Justice for Some Law and the Question of Palestine which by the way is very good and I have it. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So without any further ado, let's bring Nura into the stream. Hi, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Hi, Katie. Hi, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. Um, and, and before you start asking me questions and I should have said this on the back end, um, thank you for the work that you do and for standing strong in the face of attacks and harassment and intimidation. Uh, in order to make you, you know, recoil against uh, that intimidation and away from the truth and standing down. Thank you for standing wow, thank up. thank you. That is so nice to hear from you because you are such an amazing advocate and you actually do a lot of the real work. All I did was rant a little bit in a video, but I really do appreciate what you just said. Uh, I'm just going to get this back. Okay. Um, yeah, someone wrote, hi, Nura, you're a hero. So I co-signed that. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, because as people who are watching this know, and again, this isn't about me, I just happened to do a video arguing that Israel was an apartheid state, and then that video was censored, and I was fired when I pushed back trying to get it screen streamed, um, published. Uh, one of the things that I've heard back from a lot of people, both critics, but even some supportive people, is that, well, this is different. Israeli, whatever Israel is doing isn't apartheid because apartheid is about race and Israel's uh, occupation is not about race. And I actually wanted to, if you don't mind, uh, to read you uh, some short uh, excerpts from, of, from two articles that I would love for you to respond to. So one is actually from um, a woman who is an editor of uh, Haaretz opinion section uh, Anat Kam. She's the deputy editor of the opinion section, section at Haaretz. And she wrote a piece in uh, response to my op-ed that I wrote at the Daily Beast. And her article is called, Israel's Got Major Problems, But It's Not an Apartheid State. And mm. she writes, Israel is not an apartheid state. According to Miriam Webster, apartheid is a racial segregation and specifically a former policy of segregation and political, social, and economic discrimination against the non-white majority in the Republic of South Africa. This definition is easy to dissolve. Israel does not have a racial segregation implemented by law. It's an easy fact check. And then she continues. There are Arab citizens, citizens with full equal rights in the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, as well as in the Israeli court system, including the Supreme Court. There are Arab doctors, professors, policemen, teachers, and countless other professionals working side by side with Jews. Not all of them consider themselves Palestinian. 
and it's not for Halper or anyone else to define their national identity for them. And there are many Druze and Bedouins who are part of the Arab population in Israel who serve in the Israel Defense Forces. So, and then she makes one more argument. Calling Israel an apartheid state also flattens a complicated but crucial issue. It does not distinguish between the state of Israel within the Green Line, Israel's eastern border prior to the 1967 Six-Day War, and the occupied West Bank. Make no mistake, Israel's occupation of the West Bank and its blockade of the Gaza Strip is a decades-long and ongoing war crime with ethnic segregation and no equal protection under the law, but it is not within the state of Israel. So there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, Katie, I, I, mean, I should read I should read my book out uh, loud to your it, audience. So it is let really me do good. this. Let me do this. I heard I heard four things we need to unpack. So let's just we can go through them. Um, one of them is about Israel's jurisdiction and what it covers and this idea of a partition between the Green Line and the, and, and the occupied territories. So that's one. The other one is about, you know, also another mythology that we need to unpack about, you know, Palestinian inclusion in Israeli society. So the Palestinian citizens of Israel and where they're included. That's the second myth. Um, the third thing that we need to unpack has to do more with law and what the Convention on Apartheid tells us from 1973 and the system that it did condemn. And the last thing that we're going to need to unpack is going to be about what is a racial theory of Zionism and how does that apply? So I'm going to work backwards. And if I forget, I hope that you remember so you can remind me about these four points. So let's just start with the first one really, really quick. The idea that um, this editor wants to distinguish between the Green Line and the territories, one is a very, very old and dead argument and doesn't actually take into account facts on the ground today, right? One may have said that that partition um, was relevant and existed and had some meaning in the early 90s even, which even then was stretching it. But the truth is, is that this is a false partition. There is no distinction between Israel's governance over all people from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea. It just applies different systems, uh, different legal systems to the people that live between those borders. Um, and Israel itself hasn't even declared the borders. So the idea that there's a green line to speak of is also a mythology. What green line? What green line? It's supposed to refer to the armistice lines of 1949 that are also conflated with the 1967 borders, so to speak, after the 1967 war. Israel never recognized those borders, has always, has, has since, um, you know, the ascendance of the Likud uh, government, actually, no, uh, right after the, the, the 1967 war, it was a labor um, government, mm -hmm. Israeli labor government that began the settlement enterprise under um, Eshkol I, and forget the names right now, but it was a labor government that began it. It was accelerated accelerated under Menachem Begin after the ascendance of Lakut in 1977, which is to say that Israel has settled all sides of no line. So that's one. Israel has a single jurisdiction between the river and the sea. And that is only distinguished by different sets of ways that it governs um, and discriminates against the Palestinians. It uses, it has one goal, of taking more territory uh, for Zionist settlement and shrinking the number of Palestinians and concentrating those re that remain on the smallest amounts of land. It's a settler colonial project. It uses martial law in the West Bank, all out warfare in Gaza, administrative um, and civil law in East Jerusalem and civil law within Israel to achieve that discrimination. Moving on, okay. number two. I check. Number two, what about the Palestinians who can be in parliament and can be in, 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 in court systems and whatnot? So whoever um, says this, one, is also likely to tell us, oh, well, in the United States, right, the United States can exercise Jim Crow and be uh, separate but equal, right? Which was an argument that Americans made, which was an argument that American apologists continue to make about you know discrimination in the United States, that they could call the United States a democracy, even though black people right had to sit had to to be in separate classrooms, had to achieve separate education, couldn't live in in certain neighborhoods. So I just want folks that by way of analogy, right, start there. If you can't imagine 
what it means for Palestinians to participate in some realms of life, but still to be racially subjugated, start there. Now, in regards to the specificity of Palestine, understand that when Israel was established in 1948, it applied martial law in Israel, right, where, where it declared its uh, independence, only to the Palestinians who did not become refugees. So for 18 years, it exercised martial law on the Palestinian population within its borders in order to achieve territorial expansion within Israel, because it builds 370 settlements immediately within Israel, but they're Jewish Zionist settlements. And it enables, the, it enables um, mm -hmm. officers to arrest Palestinians, to check for their papers, to deport them immediately, to shut down media, to shut down newspapers, to prohibit any kind of gatherings. It's literally the martial law that we see applied under military, the military occupation we know today in the, in, in the West Bank that was applied against the citizens who remained, who were approximately 100 to 120,000 um, in 1948. That application, according to Ben-Gurion, the military law had no security purpose. It actually had a settler colonial purpose, which was to achieve the consult, you know, the taking of the greatest amount of territory with the least number of Palestinians. And that's why it remained in place. And what that martial law did, right, was to create an exception, a racial exception, for those Palestinians who remained, who ostensibly were not removed from their homes, ostensibly are within Israel, and yet are still subject to an entirely different system. And that racial exception remains until this day. And that's why we see police forces within Israel attack, for example, use lethal force against Palestinians as they did in 2013, um, uh, in October, excuse me, 2003, when 13 Palestinians were killed during their protest in the midst of the Second Intifada, what's known as the Al-Aqsa Intifada. It's why we can see in May 2021, mobs, mobs of Jewish Israelis chasing down Palestinian citizens in their own homes. And the Palestinian citizens have no one to call to protect them. Tamir Nafar, I remember this vividly, was on television saying, I can't even call the Israeli police to protect me from these mobs because they will protect the settlers as they attack me, right? This is the, the inseparability of the state and state violence and the settler, right? Who, on whose behalf that, that, that state violence exists in order to, to entrench their takings. And that's to say nothing of, of, of the myriad ways that the law and the system itself discriminates against these Palestinian citizens. The Adala Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights, for example, has a database of over 60 laws that demonstrates, right, how Israel either um, explicitly, explicitly violates the rights of those Palestinian citizens, or like as a prima facie case, or does it um, by disparate impact. So take, for example, just take, here's one example employers, um, landlords can easily say only uh, those who have served in the military can apply for this job or for this housing. Right. Well, what does that mean for the Palestinians who do not serve in the army, right? It means that they're not welcome. That's not an explicit, it's not prima facie, but it's obviously discriminatory. So suffice it to say that this is a mythology. And for this person who cares about listening to the people who are affected, let the Palestinian citizens of Israel speak for themselves and tell you what their lives are like. They are suffering. They continue to suffer and to endure forced displacement as the Palestinians from Akrit and Bir'am in the north are citizens of the state, but still internally displaced persons because they can't return to their homes of origin. Right? Or the Palestinians who are in the in the Naqab in 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 the south, where they are they are um, being forcibly displaced and removed into urban townships. So that was number two. Number three, we're on apartheid. Apartheid, okay, does not refer to what happened in South Africa in 1973. Just like racism does not refer to any single place on earth, right? 
But according to the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the first human rights treaty drafted in 1965, but not ratified until far later because states didn't want to recognize it, and primarily the United States. The United States didn't ratify the third convention, I think, until it was 1994. All right. But apartheid becomes a crime against humanity when a treaty declares it as such in 1973. And though it's in reference, right, it's, it's telling us about a system of governance in Southern Africa, in Namibia and South Africa, it's actually, right, telling us about a system of governance that can exist anywhere. And you have there enumerated the six elements, right, non-exhaustive elements, which means right. Some of these, maybe all of them, perhaps more, that together would constitute a form of apartheid. And what it has to feature is that the law is used, right? That the law is used to ensure the domination of one racial group over any other racial group, right? And achieve through their, their, their separation. So it says nothing about black people and white people. And it even says specifically, right, that it's not just South Africa, like you just referred to. It's explicit in that it can be like what happened in South Africa, but it's not limited to what happened in South Africa. Well, that doesn't appear in the 1973 treaty, but that appears later in the Committee oh, and, for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination okay. when, they, when they find, right, that apartheid can be anywhere in the world. Got right? It. That's okay. literally a finding by the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And they say apartheid doesn't, explicitly, apartheid does not refer to a specific case study, apartheid is a system it. and it can appear right. everywhere. But just to be clear there, neither the CERD, the racial, the, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, nor the treaty, right, that, that recognizes apartheid as a crime against humanity, neither one of those refers to white supremacy or black bodies or African descendants, right? They're referring to racial groups. So here we get into this idea of, um, so what about her fourth point? Her fourth point, you know, whatever it is, it can't be racism because Israel doesn't, you know, Israel is not necessarily a white supremacist movement that features, you know, the subjugation of a minority over a, a, a black majority. She's literally using the South African case study here to make that argument. Now, in fairness to her, even Bet Selim, the Israeli human rights organization that concludes, was amongst the first to conclude after Yeshdin that there was, that there is, that Israel is an apartheid system, comes to the same conclusion. I mean, different in that they say there is apartheid, right. but there's no racism. I mean, that's literally what they say. They say there's Jewish supremacy, but there's no racism. And in that, Again, they repeat this mantra that because there's no black, you know, this isn't about right. against black people. There's black Israelis, there's black Palestinians, right. they're Afro descendant, da, da 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 This understanding of racism is horribly flawed, okay? And this gets us into the story of, well, what is race? Right. Well, what we know for sure, for sure, that contrary to those, bi you know, to the bi biological, um, you know, the, the biological arguments about race, that it's somehow connected to how we're born, that has been long, you know, discredited. Our DNA is too similar across right. humanity to be able to, you know, to evidence some sort of a eugenic argument, eugenics argument about what distinguishes us from one another. So we've long known that, that that's not racism, right? We also know, according to what a lot of critical racial theorists and, and, and race scholars will, will show and tell us, racism is, is a construct, right? Racial categories right. have been constructed. Cedric Robinson, right, uh, author of Black Marxism, who racial capitalism is largely attributed to as a concept, shows us that across time and space that racism changes. It's historically and materially contingent. It produces a political economy for those in power in order to justify the accumulation of wealth among some for the deprivation of wealth. And here by deprivation, I'm saying not just money wealth, right? But health wealth, opportunity wealth, life wealth, right? From, from, uh, from others. It's what Ruth Wilson Gilmore describes to us as what subjects certain groups to the condition of premature death. This has nothing, right, 
to do with some biological function that we need to untrace. This is about studying the historical and material conditions that are racializing certain groups, that are subjecting them to a condition of premature death and deprivation. And this is precisely what Zionism, right, has subjected Palestinians to. Ipso facto, Zionism conditions the deprivation of Palestinians of their land, of their life, of their futures, right? And subjects them to lesser life chances, in fact, is predicated on their elimination in order to succeed. And so now we should also think about, you know, our Palestinian intellectual tradition who have long, you know, provided for us racial theories right. about Zionism and primary for me amongst them is Faya Sayyid, who is the architect, you know, and the primary engine for resolution 3379 is the 1975 resolution that declares that Zionism is a form of racism and racial discrimination who shows us as early as 1965 in his pamphlet on the Zionist colonization of Palestine that, right, that Zionism is uh, constituted, uh, you know, Zionism's insistence that Jews are a, right. are a racial group, irrespective of religious piety or ethnic heterogeneity, produces three corollaries of self-segregation, right, of racial segregation, racial purity, right, and racial supremacy and also provides for us a theory of understanding that if other colonial movements in Asia and Africa were predicated on the domination of racial groups, racial domination, Zionism is predicated on racial elimination. So how you can understand how, you know, it's what Nadia Abul Hajj has critiqued, you know, Zionist for, which is, the entire Zionist movement is predicated on the ideas that Jews are a race and therefore right. can establish the state. But as soon as Israel is formed, now that racial distinction disappears and they try to say Jews are not a race, Palestinians are not a race, except we've been racialized. We've been racialized. And this is not to say anything, Katie, of the way that, you know, how, you know, we're treated by the military occupation system or the criminal system, how there's a shoot to kill policy that basically assumes Palestinians are guilty, right? Uh, until they're proven innocent, how there's racial anxiety around Palestinians, not because of the threat they pose, but because existentially, the more Palestinians are alive, right? Or that live, the lesser chance that Israel as you know, a, a place that's established of Jewish supremacy and a demographic Jewish majority can be viable. We are an existential threat by existence. So these are the ways that race are constructed. So yeah, her article, whatever. <laughs> All that to say is I, I disagree thoroughly with everything that she says. And it's really just so exhausting, right? That she can make such bankrupt old arguments that we have dismantled as Palestinian scholars and others over and over again. And yet precisely because of the epistemic erasures of Palestinians in knowledge production and of advocates speaking for ourselves, we don't get read. And then we have to wait for Israeli human rights groups and legacy right. human rights groups to say the same thing that we've been saying, you know, for, for decades now. And right. she's doing the same thing when she's trying to recycle these old bankrupt arguments. Yeah. And it's, kind of more dangerous in some ways because she acknowledges that the the occupation is problematic. So it's, we expect, you know, the expectation is, oh, well, she must be telling the truth because she's not an Israel apologist. But I think for lots of people who are critical of Israel, apartheid is a bridge too far. I think what's important here uh, for folks to hear when they hear this argument Right. And what you're pointing out, oh, she can't be an Israel apologist because she condemns the occupation is to no. understand that liberal Zionism is an, is an apology for Israel. Right. Liberal Zionism assumes it apologizes for Zionism. And that's what it is. Right. It assumes that Israel, if it were just contained. Right. If it didn't expand yeah. beyond into Jerusalem, you know, the Jerusalem, including the West Bank, including Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. And it just recognized Palestinian sovereignty in these territories. That is that Zionism was fine. These people assume that, you know, Israel became a Frankenstein because it never, you know, limited its territorial expansion. But what those people are doing is to basically say 
that the million Palestinians and their descendants who were removed from their homes, especially between 1947 and 1949, right? that they don't matter. They don't have a right to return to their home. It forgives that ethnic cleansing. It apologizes for that ethnic cleansing and says that it's necessary. It's Benny Morris's argument who says that Ben Gurion's mistake was not to kill more Palestinians yeah. so that they weren't ever, they don't pose a demographic challenge to the state of Israel now, right? Yeah. These are the apologists who can't see that the greatest pillar of Israeli apartheid is a law of return for Jews right. anywhere in the world and no correlate, right? For Palestinians who can actually trace their lineage, lineage and for even those Palestinians who, who are older than the state and still living, right? right. These I, I want, you know, I'm just, I just want to emphasize for your audience that yes, this person is an apologist. She's not, she's just not a hawk. But she is an apologist for Israel and certainly an apologist for Zionism. And the problem that we're, we're we're actually encountering right now and what we're dealing with, which is really exciting, but also all this tension, especially when we see in the, um, you know, IRA definition of anti-Semitism that wants to oh, yeah. equate anti-Semitism to critique of Israel, is we're, we're, we're experiencing, you know, a full embrace and a radical return to a critique of Zionism. So that you can't apologize for Israel because you have to understand that it was it was built on a discriminatory principle. It defines itself upon a basis of discrimination. It just tries to make an exception for itself yeah. by saying, but we need this. And so Palestinians can be sacrificed in order to make this uh, in order to realize right uh, 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 the creation and the, uh, and the, and the sustenance of a, of, of a Jewish state. Right. But even that's racist. Right. And it's, it's interesting because, I mean, I'm not religious, but I could, as I said before, I could move to Israel today and become a, a citizen and not just a citizen, but a national, right? A Jewish national, which, as you point out, those things are very different. Um, so and I'm not religious. So obviously Israel's own definition is a racialized one because it's not my religious definition that lets me be a Jew, according to them. There's something else. Right. There's an ethnic component. So. Even their well, own. This is, this is precisely why this becomes so controversial, right? Yeah. Because European anti-Semitism predicated the exclusion right. of Jewish people from Europe and their ineligibility for whiteness on this idea that they constitute their own race. I mean, right. that's why this is so problematic. The fact, right, that Zionism internalizes this logic, enshrines it juridically right, in, in, the, uh, in Israel's citizenship law, which is misnamed, it should be the national law, so that it defines a Jewish national as anyone born to a Jewish mother. And, you know, we'd have to go through, I think it's like an article four, I don't have it memorized, right? But that it, you have a juridical definition of who a Jewish national is, that as you point out, has nothing to do with religious observance, right? right? It's it's this kind of you know this 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 uh, matrilineal um, descendants. You can't even. Right. There are ways that you might be able to convert to Judaism, but, hard. but they're very hard. It's yeah. super limited. Palestinian, right? It's it's it's. I was going to ask gonna you about that. You meant, right. I was gonna, another time. Not I that we want to. I'm not saying that we right, want to. But, but I was actually curious because you mentioned something that people know that some people have tried to do that, but that's, I'm curious about what happens there, but I'll, I'll have you on another time to talk about that because that's a whole other. Um, I mean, the only thing I'll say there, honestly, is that this is, this is ways to really expose the system for what it is, right? This is not about creating, you know, Jewish nationality is actually, you know, pre is also built right in opposition to what Palestinians are. Right. right? And so, you know, the whole idea, and this, I, I, I get into this in an article where I use Cheryl Harris's Whiteness as Property, a seminal, seminal piece that she writes to demonstrate that whiteness, again, here's critical race theorists who are showing us whiteness is, is, has property elements, right? You can actually transfer it. It has a particular value. It's not like some biological function. I read that on to Israel in order to demonstrate how that, how, you know, first, um, Zionists internalized a white supremacist logic that excluded them from Europe. Then, and this is the work of Max Eil and Shirin Say Ali, then, you know, they seek inclusion within Europe by establishing a state outside of Europe's shores. In creating the new Jew, 
right? The new Jew was very much a Western Jew. So that there's even an internal exclusion of the Middle Eastern Jews who right. become Israeli. They are subjugated. They are racially marginalized. They establish their own um, Black Panther Party in order to protest their discrimination. They are placed in the borderland so that they can uh, be the buffer zone and ongoing um, hostilities with Arab uh, armies. They are their children are taken away from them so that they can be civilized and become more European. They can become Ashkenazi, right? right. They are taken away from their Arab oh, language. Sorry. This is a process of whiteness. And of, of and this is a process of, of turning the new Jew, the Israeli, is specifically a European uh, figure. And, and one of the reasons that Middle Eastern Jews are, are buy into this is because at least they're not Palestinians. Yeah. The more, even though they're the closest to Palestinians, they're Arab. They're Arab. They speak the same, we, we speak the same language. There's, there's so many cultural norms that overlap and, and share, but in order to not, in order to create some value and, you know, supremacy in their lives, they have to create the greatest amount of distinction and separation and distance from Palestinians, right? They can be at the bottom of, of the racial ladder within Israel, but they're not Palestinian, right? And so here are the ways that we have to examine, like this is complicated. This is not just about Jewish nationals or, or Zionist settlers and Palestinians, but even internally we can right. unpack it. Uh, and it, and it, there, there's a racial logic inherent to Zionism and a racial logic that actually or as an organizing principle within Israeli society, even if we all disappeared as Palestinians. Right. Which I recommend for people to read Ibtisam Azam's novel, The Book of Disappearance, oh, that okay. imagines the moment when all Palestinians, you know, this fantasy of when Palestinians disappear, what happens then? It's an excellent book and really haunting. And, you know, she, she's she's a Palestinian citizen of the state. Right. Wow. And she basically, you know, she's giving us a, a very scrutinizing image of Israeli society um, and who they are speaking as a Palestinian citizen. I wanted to just ask you, this obviously wasn't planned, but I know one of the things that is so great about your analysis is it's so comprehensive and you look at anti-Semitism, you look at um, things through a historical lens, a legal lens, uh, pop culture too. So someone wrote in the comments uh, something that I want to push back on. I thought you'd do this better than me. Uh, oh, fun. <laughs> uh, they said, Katie's firing proves that Kanye was right. I'm assuming Kanye's anti-Semitic comments. So how do we push back against that? Oh, wait a minute. So let me just make this connection. You get fired for criticizing Israel, yeah. and so Kanye being an you know his anti-Semitic tropes about right. Jewish Jews. power and yeah. influence must be right. right. Yeah. yeah, let's let's you know look, anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish bigotry is uh, stems right stems very centrally from white supremacy. So let's let's just understand that from the get, and so our entire struggle against white supremacy as Palestinians, as black and brown peoples, as indigenous peoples across the world also includes a battle against anti-Semitism, right? The reason that, you know, you, Katie, are fired is because right now there happens to be a consolidation of power of, and, and, and really in the United States, it's, it's almost always been this way in regards to Israel, right? right. The United States is, is, it, when Israel is established, is not necessarily a major um, Israel, you know, um, ally. That's when the English and the French are its primary patrons. But after the 1967 war, the U.S. takes the mantle as the imperial patron to Israel, right? And it's that aftermath, and they do that. They do that not because they want to protect Jews in the world, right? Because they might have done that, you know, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, right. um, when Zionism then, you know, becomes the overwhelming um, answer and how the question of Palestine transforms at the United Nation into the question about Jewish refugees, right? They don't do it then. They do it in 1967 when the U.S. is neck deep in a cold war across the world. And Israel, by demonstrating its military might, demonstrates to the United States that it's a key cold war asset in the Middle East. So the U.S. establishes 
a, a two-part policy. One is to ensure Israel's qualitative military edge so that it can defeat any single Middle Eastern army alone or all of them put together, which is why Israel now has nuclear capability and is the 11th most significant military power in the world. And this other policy, which is that any resolution right to the Arab-Israeli conflict, as it was once called, or to the Palestinian freedom struggle, will be achieved through political negotiation. And basically, that will not apply any kind of values and principles to it. So why is that relevant? The U.S. is concerned with Israel for itself to achieve its interests, not because, right, there was some Jewish conspiracy, right. and which is a classic anti-Semitic trope, but because the U.S. has interests it wants to achieve. Now, there's a number of other factors if you want to understand why the United States is so blindly Zionist as a society, right? In the same way that it's frankly white supremacist, in the same way that, you know, it's it's very much, um, um, it's a settler colony. So it's it's anti-indigenous, you know, native, uh, native American erasure and anti-native um, racism is embedded in it. It's, it has that relationship to Zionism, not merely because of these political interests, but also because of cultural norms. Right. Read Amy Kaplan, who examines for us how right how Zionism becomes part of a cultural norm just by the mere publication and distribution and translation of the book Exodus mm -hmm. or 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 think about Christian Zionists who for them. Right. And they were the primary, you know, they were the primary allies to the, the, the Trump administration who accelerated these policies. It wasn't just Zionists. It was Christian Zionists. Right. There's right. no Jewish conspiracy here. These are the people. Right. These are are are, are the I don't want to I don't even know what to call them. These are the the Christians who yeah. believe that in order to beget the second coming of Christ, all Jews have to be in Palestine, yeah. at which point yeah, Armageddon yeah. will occur. Right. They'll they'll be annihilated and then they can go as Christian Zionists and assume sovereignty over the area. Right. That's not some Jewish conspiracy. But right. they have or you know this, you know, but they have a tremendous amount of power. They have a tremendous amount of power. So we're in this really complicated area where it's too easy to want to say that this is about Jewish power when in fact this has nothing to do with that, right? Anti-Semitism is alive and well. The Trump administration continued to present the greatest threat to Jewish life, right? right? Um, and at the same time, was the greatest ally to Israel. So can you wrap your head? Right, exactly. This person who's, ans don't, don't, we have to, you know, and, and you know, F Kanye too. Yeah. Uh, for, for this attention and for the way that he's using such a remarkable platform that he has in order to to basically make it about him. I don't even want to get into the arguments yeah. he's making. No, I just he's, wanted to honestly uh, get into the, because I know that it's something, I mean, I've said this, that I hate that when firings like this happen or when things like this happen, I hate it because it actually lends itself to that trope, which is an anti-Semitic trope. It's not, and that's not how it works, but um, that's not how it works. But, and, and, something that's so frustrating is that it's precisely the anti-defamation league and APEC who contribute to this idea because they're the ones who conflate Jewishness with Zionism. And then claim that we're the ones doing it and that right. we're anti-Semitic. I mean, if you remember, there's some work that I'm, I've been doing, I'm actually taking off, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in Durham um, next week. Durham was the only successful municipal campaign in the United States to abolish its police trainings in Israel. It's incredible. It's incredible. Um, even though many other municipalities have so tried. Interesting. Wow. And and one of the things that like comes up there is how the Jewish community itself is responding to a rising tide of white supremacist anti-Semitism, right? At at Charlottesville, um, the Pittsburgh massacre, right? The attack on the on the synagogue. Um, and you see a split in the Jewish community. Some Jews in the community, right? Establishment Jews believe that they need more police. Mm. They need more guards at their synagogue. They need to collaborate with the FBI to protect themselves, right? They're thinking more guns, 
more borders, more violence in order to protect themselves. And there's an other large contingent of Jews who understand that the only way to be safe in this context is to actually be in solidarity with everyone else who is under attack. So you can't collaborate with the FBI because the FBI is targeting Muslims and black people. You can't have more guns and more police because the police are part of the problem and black folks have demanded abolition. You can't, in, you know, advocate for, you know, greater, more money and weapons to Israel as a garrison state because they are, that state is annihilating Palestinians. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's trends even within the Jewish community of how to understand how to ensure Jewish survival and safety. One says safety through solidarity and other says, you know, board it up, bang it out. And, right. and, and that's not actually keeping us safe at all, but it's only ensuring that a lot of people will, will die and, and some may survive. Right. Well, Nura, thank you so much. I, you have, you've been so generous with your time. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah. Before I go, I brought yeah. all that up about Durham to say that, oh, the yeah. ADL, that the ADL, right. When, when this campaign was going on, that the ADL accused this campaign of being anti-Semitic because they tried to say that it singled out Israel, except these police weren't training anywhere else but Israel. So how is that singling out? That's just right. empirical fact. And the other argument that they made is that anybody who made the argument, you know, anyone who decried uh, the police training in Israel was basically saying that U.S. police are violent because they were trained in Israel. That's not what folks ever said. The U.S. needs no, needs no support in achieving totalizing force. They were saying that there should not be this arrangement right. that basically consolidates this form of state violence um, and ensures, you know, that there is an elite that are being protected. So this was a critique about state violence and its its transnational circuits. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Wow. Yeah, I want. Do you want? I would love for. I know you have to run, but I'd love for you and Miko to just uh, overlap Absolutely, for a please. few minutes. So Miko, we're going to bring you in. I uh, hope you're ready, Miko. So the other person I'm about to bring on is uh, an, also an amazing guest. He is a speaker, writer, and um, karate instructor. Uh, his maternal grandfather was one of the signatories of Israel's Declaration of Independence. His father was a decorated general who fought in the 1948 Arab-Israeli War and served as a general uh, in the Six-Day War. He became a critic of Israel and participated in dialogue with the PLO. And Miko himself uh, started out as a proud Zionist and is now an anti-Zionist um, and supports a one state. And he's the author of The General Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. And the other book he's an author of is Injustice, the Story of the Holy Land Foundation 5. So let us bring on Miko. Hi, Miko. Oops. How are you? Hi. Good. You? Great. Good to be with you. Hi, Nora. You sound terrific. Yeah. Hi, Miko. Great to see you. Hey. Just wanted to give you guys a chance to say hello and also thank both of you for what you do. Um, you know, then I'll, I'll do my turn. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Miko, for uh, what you do and also uh, doing this work before now it's become a trend, but that you, you know, you were setting the stage of what it means to use your privilege um, in order. Uh, to make the world a better place, and especially for shedding light uh, more recently on the injustices of the Holy Land Five well, and the racialization of Muslims in the U.S. Yeah, and well, thanks for saying yeah. that, Nora. I mean, listening to you over the last whatever it is, forty-five minutes or so, it's been just uh, just fantastic. I mean, you nail it. You just nail it. You just nail it. It's almost like okay, we can all go home now. Yeah, you right. nailed it. Well, Seriously. let's let's uh, not go home, but We're let's not going continue home. to yeah, fight with one another more, but, and then, yeah. yeah, pass the mic to you. So yeah. but it was fantastic. Good seeing you. <laughs> nice to see you, too. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay, so excited to be talking to Miko, and thanks again so much for joining. And everyone has to read his book. I just listened to it on um, the audio book, and it's really cool because Miko actually reads it, which is great. Um, it's so nice when the author reads the book. Uh, I also just bought it for my little niece. Um, well, my cousin's daughter, technically, but she's uh, 14 and she really likes it. She says it's very interesting. Great. Yeah. Well, that's a great compliment. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk to you about so many things, but I guess for people who aren't familiar with your story, can you give um, 
a little bit, just of a, a summary of how you evolved from being a proud Zionist to the person you are today? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks again for having me. It's, it's you know, it's great to chat with you again. It was great, like I said, to hear Nora speak. Um, it's an honor to to share that stage with her for a few minutes. Um, it's really quite simple. It's a story of someone who grew up, you know, to paraphrase Fanon, in the sphere of the privileged, where the roads are paved and the lawns are green and it's safe and beautiful, to the sphere of the other, to the sphere of the colonized, the oppressed, where the roads are full of potholes and it's dusty and there's no, no playground, there are no playgrounds, there are no sidewalks, there's a lack of water and electricity. What's unique about this, the, the situation in which I was raised is the proximity between the two spheres. As an Israeli, really all you have to do is cross the street sometimes to go from one to the other. And it's very rare to see Israelis do that because we are told that the people who live on the other side, besides being you know, uncivilized and unclean and lazy and, and dishonest, are also very violent and they hate us and they want to kill us. So we have to be very careful that it's dangerous for us to go there. Now, we don't speak the same language. We don't share the same culture. We're kind of European coloni you know, colonizers, and they are you know, Arabs, Palestinian Arabs. Um, we don't grow up learning anything about Palestine, about Arab culture, about Arab poetry, about Arab literature, nothing at all. Arab history, nothing at all. Um, and so, as far as we know, what we're being told that these people are way beneath us and are dangerous is the truth. And then at 18, they give us a uniform and a gun. And they say, well, now you have to defend your home from these people who want to kill you. So what I did is I took a step into that other sphere. And I was a proud Zionist. I mean, my dad was a general in 1967. I mean, in Israeli mythology, that's the gods of the Olympus. Those, those generals who were like, you know, who led the Israeli army uh, to this, you know, miraculous, uh, you know, this is in the mythology, right? Miraculous yeah. victory were gods. Um, and so that's, uh, and then, you know, my grandfather, the story of my grandparents, how they immigrated, how they worked to build the Jewish state and this and that and the other. Uh, I was very proud of that until I crossed and began to talk to Palestinians and understand and learn what the story of Palestine really is. And then I was faced with a choice, uh, either, either stick to my Zionism and my patriotism as an Israeli or follow kind of values and, uh, you know, that are greater than that, which talk about humanity and, and democracy and equality and, you know, that sort of thing. And, 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 um, and breaking the barriers, these artificial barriers that exist between us and recognize where I come from and what led me to be the person that I am in terms of the privilege and the society in which I grew up, the, the, the privileged society. And that's a, that's that, that was a choice. It's not easy to make because you bring this whole baggage. In my case, it's not just a historical and national baggage, but it's a very personal family baggage. And uh, it's interesting. I just heard an interview with Yossi Balin, and who was kind of one of the architects of Oslo and is considered a peacenik. And he was asked, what's more important, democracy or a Jewish state? And he said, of course, a Jewish state. Of course, a Jewish state. He said, this is coming, he said, from a real peacenik like myself, you know. I thought, you racist hypocrite. You racist hypocrite. First of all, Oslo is a catastrophe, but um, anyone that can say that an, this idea of a Jewish state is more important than humanity and democracy is, 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 um, is a racist, you know, basically. Um, so that was the choice that I had to make, and I made the choice to, you know, to see the, 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 the bit, what I thought was the bigger picture. Wow. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, something that, and I'm, um, uh, you've spoken about this and I'm my condolences, but your niece um, was killed. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people that would have been something that maybe made it hard for them to believe in any kind of alternative to the status quo. But it seems like that was something that made you that much more committed to human rights. Yes. Well, there are several aspects to that. So first of all, the death of this 13-year-old girl that I loved so much and you know we all loved so much 
uh, in, in such a sudden, violent, horrifying way is exactly the kind of thing that forces us to change. That's precisely, sadly enough, I think when we, the, you know, big change in our perspective and our belief system um, usually comes as a result of something terrible, mm. a terrible experience. And that's precisely, this is exactly the kind of horrific experience that forces us. Now, uh, I, I can't really take the, the, the credit for what I did afterwards because my sister, Nareet, who's, you know, this was her daughter, when she was ta- asked about revenge and retaliation and all the things that Israelis love so much, she said no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. And wow, you know, I mean, so she said, you know, you're talking to me about killing more people in response to this horrific death of my daughter. Are you out of your minds? Are you out of your minds? And so then suddenly she humanized every, everything. Every, the people became people. And then you wonder, well, these three young Palestinians that took their own lives, three young men, you know, took their lives and the lives of all these, you know, uh, people with them, innocent people that they didn't, never knew. What, what, you know, you got to pause, you got to think, wait a minute, what, what is happening here? How does, what, what kind of a reality brings something like this to happen? You know, you have to engage and go deeper to find out what, what, what are, what's going on here? How does this happen? What kind of reality brought these people to do such a thing to themselves, to their own families, and to the families of, of, the, of, the, of the other victims? Um, so, you know, my sister's words obviously were, were a huge, had a huge impact on me. And, um, and then I went ahead and engaged and, you know, saw Palestinians to engage with and so on. Hmm. And um, your brother-in-law, right, um, started working with a Palestinian man whose daughter was killed by Israeli forces. Right. So my sister and brother-in-law were invited to join what's called the Families Forum or the Bereaved Families Forum, which is a forum of bereaved families from both sides that was started by Itzhak Frankenthal. And um, it's, a, it's an incredibly moving uh, experience to see these people and then uh but Samar Amin who is now works very closely with my brother-in-law Rami a couple of years uh, actually exactly almost exactly 10 years after Smadar was killed my niece his daughter was shot in Anata on her way home from school she was walking hand in hand with her sister and um, she was shot in the head by a soldier who took aim and just shot there was no, you know, there was no, <laughs> there was nothing there. He just took aim and shot this little girl. And uh, Bassam also eventually, of course, joined this uh, group. And then, and he and Rami have, you know, been ever since uh, good friends and, and speaking and, and so on. Yes. Mm. Well, um, it's really a moving story. Again, I really highly recommend it that people read it, The General Sun. Um, Shifting gears a, a little bit, I wanted, you know, there's so many stereotypes that I wanted you to debunk that, you know, Nura obviously debunked a lot of the, the misinformation about um, apartheid. And I realized that a, an, a, an easy way maybe to do this is that luckily, thank God for small favors, um, Netanyahu went on Bill Maher the other day, which gives us a great opportunity because between the two of them, they just... Um, regurgitated all this propaganda so if it's okay with you i thought we could watch some of that and respond to it i know <laughs> let, me just get, let me get my sick bag i'll be right i know back. i was gonna say yeah yeah i hope you haven't eaten too much today <laughs> yeah. um let's see let's uh brad can we play this uh video he is the longest is... serving former okay, prime minister in israel's history and current opposition leader whose demo, new memoir bb my story is out on october 18th benjamin netanyahu <laughs> Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. Baby, how are you doing? You're in uh, Tel Aviv. I know there's going to be a bit of a delay, but can you hear me? I hear you fine. I missed part of your di- monologue, but I'm sure I'll make it up later. <laughs> you didn't miss a lot. I guess people in the last uh, My first question, Kanye West this week has said, I'm a bit sleepy tonight. But when I wake up, I'm going death con three on Jewish people. Will Israel retaliate? (laughs) 
You know, uh, <laughs> anti-Semitism is the longest uh, hatred in history. It goes back thousands of years. Uh, we've dealt with bigger problems than uh, than these stupidities. But, you know, the communists blame the Jews for being capitalists. The capitalists blame the Jews for being communists. You have a problem, blame the Jews. It's old stuff. It shouldn't have any place in civilized discourse. And that's the reason we established uh, the Jewish state, so the Jewish people would have defense against uh, these absurdities. And sometimes they're coupled with violence. We don't let that happen again. So he's obviously, you know, grounding this foundation of Israel, right, as a as an existential um, yeah. necessity. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to read a few quotes from American congressmen, just to Congress people, rather, just to, to show that uh, Kanye West is uh, Kanye West's comment is not really out of order with some things that are said by people in more official positions. So he's not going to name them, but he's quite quoting Rashida Tlaib, uh, Ilan Omar, and I believe the last one is AOC. Mm -hmm. uh, here's one. Israel has hypnotized the world. May Allah awaken the people and help them see the evil doings of Israel. Ten years ago, if you read that to me, I thought that would be from Hezbollah. That's an American congressperson. Another American congressperson says the reality of Israel's apartheid government goes on to say the occupation and ethnic cleansing Palestinians live with every day. Another one says Israel targets media sources so the world can't see Palestinians being massacred. Uh, I have three questions for you. Are you massacring Palestinians? Are you ethnic cleansing and are you an apartheid state? No, no, and no. I mean, these are all ridiculous uh, charges against the one democracy in the Middle East, the one democracy that upholds human rights, that defends freedom, and is America's best ally. So I think these people should... Um, uh, wake up to reality, but I, I think that's uh, uh, a far uh, too great a hope. It's not going to happen. We just have to defend ourselves against these people because they purvey lies. You ever hear? So what is your response to this claim? Because I hear this all the time, which is that Israel is the only democracy in that region. Israel is not a democracy by any stretch of the imagination. Israel is a brutal apartheid regime that gives privilege to Jewish people over, over, over Palestinians. It's not a democracy, not even by a long shot. I mean, if you look at the, the conditions of, even Hanura touched on this too, the conditions of citizens of Israel who are Palestinians, are, the, the, they're so appalling. They're so horrific. The racism, uh, the, 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 the systemic racism um, is so horrific. The discrimination, the systemic discrimination the racist discourse by politicians, by the press, you know, by people in the street, I mean, people you meet, uh, you know, every day it is so uh, uh, unapologetic. To call Israel as a, de a democracy is, is, is an absolute joke. I mean, it would be a joke if it wasn't so absolutely horrifyingly tragic. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, definitely something that you hear. And I can't believe you still hear it, but you do still hear it. And by the way, sorry, the, they were, that, the sources of these were Ilhan Omar and then Rashida Tlaib were the second course. two. Of course. Um, the word uh, fake news, this is fake old news. It goes back thousands of years. We're not impressed by it. Okay. Um, why so is no, it happening? I don't know. It's ridiculous. So no apartheid, no, no ethnic cleansing, right? Okay. That's what he's claiming so far. And just democracy. Okay. I don't know why they're clapping. I guess they're, could they agree. You become an apartheid state. The, the, the critics of Israel here in America and some in your own country uh, talk about the fact that Israel is kind of a population time bomb okay. and that if 51% of Israel would become Arab because you do have Arab citizens who are actually treated better in Israel with more rights and more freedoms than they are in their own and, and other Arab countries. Okay, that's another thing, that argument. So Israel, you live better in, Arabs in Israel are treated better than they'd be treated in other countries. I don't even know what that means. I mean, there, yeah. I, mean, I, don't, know, I don't even know what that means. I mean, this is, is, is absurd. The reality of Palestinians, whether they're citizens or not citizens, is so horrific. 
under uh, under the apartheid regime that I don't even know what they're talking about. It's it's one of these you know it's one of these claims that's thrown out there like Israel is a democracy, but nobody ever asks any you know it's like okay that's Follow what it is bumper sticker yeah. and we move on. Right. It's a kind of Bill Maher discourse. It's not right. it's complete nonsense. It means nothing. Uh, but if fifty one percent of Israel became uh, Arab, then you would have to become an apartheid state. Is that something that you think about as much as your critics do? Because I think they don't have the facts right. I mean, the, there are about 20 percent of Israel's population is Arabs, and they're really the only Arabs uh, in the Middle East who enjoy full and equal civic rights in, a, in the Israeli democracy. And I've um, also made it an effort to incorporate them in the tremendous success story that is Israel. And I'm happy to see that that is uh, happening. But the demographic balance is maintained. The, the most important thing is the democratic balance is maintained because everyone has a right to uh, be part of the Israeli democracy and the Israeli, uh, the Israeli success story. I don't think that's a real issue. I think it's a, it's a bogus uh, charge, and especially a bogus charge that's coming from the Palestinians who oppress gays, oppress women, and are in league with Iran, Iran, which is uh, tormenting its citizens, suppressing women there. And if I have to say anything, the place where they should uh, uh, direct their fire is at the Iranian regime, uh, and they should support the brave women of Iran that are showing the world what courage is. That's where it is, and that's where I am. I'm supporting the people of Iran who are standing up to real, real terror. So the argument is Palestinians should be mad at Iran. Not Israel. Well, let's backtrack. He said something yeah. which is also one of these one of these uh, mantras that needs to be corrected. Do you want me to play and it again? That, and that is that. Oh. And, and that oh. is no, no, no. And that is that. Uh, <laughs> the less we see them, the better. Yeah, the better. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that is that. That Arabs make up twenty percent of the population. So the way Israel counts Palestinians is very interesting. So Israelis are counted everywhere, from the river to the sea. Palestinians are only counted in the pre-1967 borders. And so if you only count those Palestinians, which is about less than a third of the population of Palestinians, then yeah, it's easy to do that kind of a math. But there are Palestinians, you know, there are there's about 2 million Palestinian citizens of Israel. There are over 2 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. There are about three and a half million Palestinians in the West Bank, in what used to be the West Bank. So the citizens of, among the citizens of Israel that are counted, again, only those who live in the pre-67 borders, that's 20%, perhaps. But Israel governs, you know, all the Palestinians. It's just that they categorize them different. But it's interesting that Israelis can live anywhere and are counted. Palestinians are only counted if they live in these other bound borders, you know, the pre-67 borders. Right. And again, this notion that somehow Palestinians are free and equal and, and, and enjoy the success story of Israel is, uh, is, is an absolute lie. It is an absolute lie. I can tell you stories upon stories of Palestinians. And Nura talked about the Naqab in the south, you know, 300,000 Palestinians living in abject poverty. Um, half of them in towns that are not even recognized, so they don't get any anything, any even even a little bit of services that the ones who are recognized get. Uh, and in the Naqab, some of the Israelis joy enjoy some of the highest standard of living among you know the kibbutzim and the cities in the Naqab. Israelis enjoy the highest standard of living in the country, and Palestinians who live there are the poorest of the poor. In the city of Lid, you know, Tel Aviv Airport is actually on the occupied city of Lid. It's near Tel Aviv. 40% of the population are Palestinians. There is no housing. There is no. There are no roads in their neighborhoods. There's no trash collection. There's no water supply. There's no electricity supply. And we're not talking about a handful of people. We're talking about, in each one of these places, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of, of citizens of Israel. You know, And then you can go on and on and on, all the different areas and how they're counted and how they're treated and which precise bureaucracy deals with them and so on and so forth in a way that makes it clear that they are not part of this, what he called this great success of Israel, you know. So they will build housing, they will build, you know, just again, in the city of Lid, it's a mixed city, 40% of the population are Palestinians. The Palestinian neighborhoods, the ones that have roads, 
have no uh, sidewalks, mm. you know, except for the older ones, perhaps that you know existed before, before the state. But that's one of the things you see in the differences between Israeli neighborhoods and Palestinian neighborhoods in what they call mixed cities. There are no sidewalks. There are no parks. There are no playgrounds. Uh, I mean, it goes on and on and on. It's horrific. There is no there is no planning when they when they plan the cities. When you talk about city planning, there is no planning for the Palestinian neighborhoods within the cities. You know. Um, not to mention job uh, discrimination. I mean, l- housing discrimination. It goes on and on and on and on. As, as you know, uh, uh, it's it's a complete it's a complete and it's a cruel lie because it's uh, it's evident. It's not like you, you can hide it. It's across the street from where Israelis live. Right. And he he definitely engages in some nice pink washing there, right? Which is one oh, of Israel's absolutely. favorite. Of course, of course. When they bomb Gaza, they make sure not to bomb the gays and the women. Right. Right. Yeah, they're very careful. Yeah, they center they center men and who they kill. Um, let's see. Let's go back to this. Okay. So, what about a two state solution? This is something we've heard for decades that this was the hope of the uh, problems that are so entrenched in the Middle East, a two state solution. But now that there are settlements of Israelis that are numbering close to seven hundred thousand in the West Bank and Jerusalem, is that really a, a realistic? Uh, solution for the future? Look, the, the main problem in the Middle East is, in, in the Middle East, I mean, the main problem with the, uh, Israel and the Palestinians are not the settlements. It's the persistent Palestinian refusal to recognize a Jewish state in any boundary. Uh, and I, I would tell you that uh, this, uh, there's another problem that people always said you know, you really have to solve the problem with the Palestinians before you can get peace with the broader Arab world. Now, understand that the Palestinians constitute about 1% of the Arab world. So you can't get to the 99% unless you solve the 1%. The problem with that was that the Palestinians don't want peace. They don't want a peace with Israel. They want a peace without Israel. They don't want a state next to Israel. They want a state instead of Israel. So for the last quarter of a century, they put a veto on having any more peace treaties between Israel and the Arab states. We had peace with Egypt, peace with Jordan, and then nothing for 25 years. I said, look, the way to get the peace is to go to the 99%, and then we'll get back to the 1% and see if we can get, you know, stop this Palestinian rejectionism of a Jewish state. And people said it couldn't be done. I mean, John Kerry said, you can't do that. And he got standing ovations when he said that. Well, I thought differently. So I went to the Arab states, and within four months, we had four peace treaties with four Arab states, with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, with Morocco, and with Sudan. And I think this is the way to go. We can complete the expansion of this peace And if I'm elected in a few weeks, I intend to do that. Solve the Arab-Israeli conflict with a broader Arab world, and then see if we can make get some headway with the Palestinians for a realistic solution that we can both live with. And when I say live with, I mean not die with, but live with, with security and with peace. And I think it can be done. But the so, what do you say to that? Palestinians don't want peace. Well, first of all, I want to start with what he said at the end, the issue of security and safety. There is no security and safety for Palestinians, and I think that's really important. I think what we've seen historically since the state of Israel was established, but particularly the world has been paying attention since uh, Shirin Abakli was assassinated, there is no safety. There is no one guaranteeing. There's no one guaranteeing the security and the safety of Palestinians. Palestinian blood is cheap. Palestinian uh, lives are cheap. You know, I've been to Palestine four times this year already, and it's it's almost like you know you go you go to visit Palestinian friends and you go from mourning how from house from one family to another of mourning and more mourning mourning of the funeral to funeral and these are all 19 20 21 18 eight year old I mean they're children you know there is no one no one standing to protect to defend Palestinians and this nonsense about the need to supply Israel with security a country that has this enormous army that's really actually never been militarily threatened is absolutely outrageous because a Palestinian child can be killed and they are killed almost on a, you know, on a regular basis. It could be in Gaza, it could be in Hebron, it could be in Jerusalem, it could be the Naqab, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Palestinians in in the state within Israel are not even counted when they're killed. Um, And nothing happens. There's no guarantee. So nobody's, so so that, if we're going to, if we need to, to, to talk about 
securing the safety and security and the lives of people, it should be the, the Palestinians right now, because they're the ones who are being killed for the last you know, 75 years. Um, what he said about the Palestinians is another one of these mantras that they don't want peace. First of all, the Palestinians, the PLO, which used to represent the Palestinian people, uh, consistently was the most consistent. Yasser Arafat was the most consistent voice for peace for the last three decades of his life, from the mid from the mid um, 1970s until he died. And and and, uh, and and so and so, or actually four decades almost. And um, and uh, and Israel rejected every attempt. You know, every time the Palestinians said yes to something, every time they the Palestinians agreed to uh, you know to end the armed resistance, to recognize Israel, to engage in talks. Um, Israel, of course, came up with more and more and more hurdles. Now, I don't think Palestinians should recognize the state of Israel at all. I think it was a big mistake to recognize the state of Israel. The state of Israel has no legitimacy and should be recognized as an illegitimate entity, a settler colonial entity that has no legitimacy. It uh, is engaged in ethnic cleansing. It is engaged in genocide. And it is, has established an apartheid regime in Palestine. And they've done all this over the last 75 years. It's not like it started yesterday. Now, all of these three, ethnic cleansing, genocide, and apartheid are crimes against humanity. These are crimes that are legally defined as crimes against humanity. You know, crimes against humanity, the idea of the crimes against humanity in the law was established after the genocide of the Jews in Europe, after the Holocaust. And here we are immediately, almost less than, you know, three, four years after the Holocaust ended, after the genocide was brought to a stop, they established this racist regime in Palestine by Jewish people. And the world allows this to happen, of course, not all Jewish people, but uh, Jew Jews who bought into Zionism. Um, and so it's, it's outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous that anybody would demand that Palestinians recognize this, that Palestinians accept this. There should not be a state of Israel. Now, it's nothing to do with killing Jews. So before all the Zionists jump up and down and say, Miko wants to kill Jews, there is no, that, you know, no, nobody talks about that. The only ones who talk about Jews leaving are Zionists because they don't want to live. And even Yossi Balin said this in this one interview, and I've heard kind of these you know, liberal Zionists say this many, many times. We're not interested in living in a country that's not called Israel. Well, then fine. You, there are lots of other countries around the world, but right now you chose to come to Palestine. You chose to colonize an Arab country in the middle of the Arab world and if you don't like living with Arabs, then perhaps you need to go somewhere else where there are no Arabs, you know, but you can't live in an Arab country, which is what Palestine, you know, has been for, for a very long time and say, well, we don't want to live with Arabs. You want to be living in Israel, you know, and that's precisely what is what, what the problem is. But a, 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 I think a, 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 if we're talking about justice, if we're talking about realism, if we're talking about a way in which Palestine can survive, uh, including, you know, the, the Israelis and the Palestinians who live within it, it's only through a democracy, a one-person, one-vote, pal free Palestine, free liberated Palestine, going back to being Palestine, which is what it was for thousands of years before this, you know, this illegitimate occupation uh, took hold 75 years ago. 75 years historically is not a very long time. And so we need to rid Palestine of this curse and, and, and bring it into a, um, and transform it into a real democracy with equal rights and then me immediately uh, engage in and find the mechanisms or put mechanisms in place to allow the refugees to return. Okay. I'm going to ask you more about that in a second. I just want to finish this video and then we'll go back to that. To do it is not inside out. First solve the rejection is 1%, but go to the 99% who realize that Israel is their ally, their ally in technology, their ally in solving the water problems, the energy problems, the medical problems, uh, and the, on the one hand, and also protect them against Iran. That's where you really have the breakthrough. And I write about it at some length in my book, how we got the Abraham Accords, how we change things around. And the people who are talking about uh, going into the Palestinian rabbit hole, and basically, you're going to wait another quarter of a century before anything moves. I don't want to wait a quarter of a century. I want to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict and then solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in that order. Um, and there is no doubt that you, you, uh, Donald Trump as president was good to Israel. 
got the capital moved to Jerusalem, which had been on the table for a very long time. And, and these accords that you mentioned happened under that administration. But can you keep those two ideas in your head at the same time that he was good to Israel, but he's also a dangerous demagogue who tried to have a coup in this country and does not respect democracy or democratic norms? Well, you know, I've had enough with Israeli politics, so I'm going to leave that to you. And I hear the <laughs> monologue that I must have not heard must have addressed that issue. Right, Bill? I, <laughs> I've been addressing it since 2016. No one listens to me. It's OK. Anyway, I thank you for doing this. I know it is the 75th anniversary of Israel coming up. And a lot of people thought that might never happen. I know U.S. News and World Report lists them as the 10th most powerful country in the world. It's an amazing success story. I'm just going to say to you to conclude, Mazel Tov on that and all you have done to make that possible for your country. Thank you. Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. You know, I was. I, it would have been interesting if he had brought up the fact that Trump is, really was encouraging uh, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, also that he wouldn't bring this up, but the fact that Bibi himself cozies up to authoritarian right-wing anti-Semitic governments like Hungary and Poland. But of course, Bill Maher probably doesn't know that. And if he did know that, he probably wouldn't bring it up. You know, Zionism is a racist ideology. So Zionists have always felt very comfortable among racists. There's never been a problem for Zionists uh, to cozy up to racists. I mean, the, the, it's, it's a race. It has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. It has nothing to do with Judaism. It has nothing to do with the desire to end racism anywhere. Um, and, um, you know, like Trump said, you know, there, there are good people on both sides. Yeah. There are wonderful people on both sides. Uh, you know, again, racists are racists. Whether they be Jewish or, or, or not Jewish is really immaterial to this, to this issue. And uh, it's funny because Trump recently said again that the Jews are uh, right. un ungrateful to him. Yeah, and American in many ways, Jews. if they're Zionists, the Zionists, he's right. If the Zionist Jews need to applaud him because he did something that no president dared to do, which is really a diplomatic atrocity diplomatically, which is to move to, to move the capital of, of uh, to move the, the, the embassy to Jerusalem and to recognize Israel, you know, I mean, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. I don't think people understand historically how absurd that is. It's like moving, it's like moving the American embassy in Italy from Rome to Paris. It's that absurd because Jerusalem is not recognized as a part of Israel anywhere internationally. It is not a part of Israel. It's and the consulates that exist, including the American consulate, predate the state of Israel. So the consuls in these consulates do not report to their embassies. They report to their uh, State Departments or their foreign uh, um, offices in their capitals because they're independent of the diplomatic missions in Tel Aviv. And what they did is they tried to merge these two diplomatic missions, which makes absolutely no sense. You know, my passport doesn't say I was born in Israel, my American passport. It says Jerusalem because Jerusalem is not a part of Israel, never has been recognized as a part of Israel and shouldn't be, of course. And so no president was going to do this because it's an absurdity, except a crazy guy like Trump. So I think the Zionists do owe him a, a, a debt of gratitude. Right. He says that the evangelicals are much more uh, grateful to him than the American Jews. That's true. Yeah. So why tell people about how you came to support a one state solution as opposed to a two state solution? Well, I, you know, being a, I, you know, I was, I was this liberal Zionist, and of course, the two-state solution is the only solution because I believed in the whole Zionist uh, narrative. And then I can tell you exactly when that happened. It was two thousand five, and as some of the listeners may remember, two thousand five was the beginning of what was called in Palestine the unarmed popular resistance, where every Friday all these villages and towns had not unarmed protests and they were met with enormous violence by the israeli i mean enormous violence by the israeli army unbelievable i participated in lots of those um and i went to bilain the village of bilain which is the village where they actually started this and i was walking around with some of the guys in bilain 
And there, there was no wall yet. The wall hadn't been built. It was just a fence. And there was a settlement being built on their land, which ended up being on the other side of the wall. And so we were walking towards this settlement from the village. And I took a look at the settlement. It, it was a massive city. Billions of dollars invested in housing and roads and, and recreation and schools and uh, shopping mall. I mean, it was a massive city. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, this notion that somehow settlements are going to go away, there's going to be a Palestinian state in the West Bank, is complete nonsense. So it's never going to happen. Nobody allows, nobody invests, no state, nobody invests billions and billions of dollars to build this new reality, to create this new reality, to colonize like this, and then leave. Nobody does that. It's never going to happen. Now I thought, actually, why two states? Why do they have to live in a different reality? Than they, the, the Palestinians that I was with, and I have to live in two different realities. Why do we not just have a single democracy with equal rights? And if somebody wants to buy their land and build housing, for, you know, they build housing for everybody. Because Palestinians are prohibited from living in that settlement, in that in that city that was built on their land. Prohibited from buy from living, in, from even buying. They could bring money. They could, you know, and they were prohibited from living on apart in apartments and housing that was built on their land that was stolen from their land, from the, from them. You know, it makes absolutely no sense. And then it's kind of like you know, like something clicked, and I got it. This is the whole idea of a two state solution is a Zionist construct. It's how you delay. It's how you pretend that you want peace while strengthening the grip of the, of, 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 on Palestine and strengthening the grip on all the resources and keeping the Palestinians and keeping the rest of the world thinking that it's, it's coming, it's coming. It's just a question of you know, finding the right leaders or, or the right moment, but really, really the intention is there. And if you notice, Netanyahu didn't answer the question right. about the demographic problem, about the fact that Israel will be governing you know, millions of Palestinians and that there's already a Palestinian majority. There's already a Palestinian majority between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean in historic Palestine, which is now, of course, all a single state called Israel. It's the single apartheid state. So that was another moment where I realized, actually, it's already one state. The entire country is a single state. It's a single apartheid state where I have privilege and the Palestinians have no rights regardless of where regardless of where they live within that within the within the country regardless of whether they're governed by this the, the, the military in the West Bank or by somebody else or the Nakab or anywhere else or Jerusalem they have no rights so why how does this even make sense and that was the moment really uh, for me and I remember I came back and I wrote an article and I quoted Einstein, you know, there's this famous story about mm -hmm. Einstein where he gives a test and his assistant says, but professor, you already gave these, this, this test to the same class. And he goes, yeah, well, but the answers have changed. And the answers have changed. The solution to solving or you know, the, 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 the way to solve the question of Palestine is through a single democracy with equal rights. So that was my moment of, uh, you know, epiphany. Hmm. And what do you say to people who say, you, you referred to this earlier, but Jews need a homeland, they need a safety, uh, safe haven. They're going to be at risk. Uh, it's going to be, or, or they also say, you know, Hamas is going to take control and throw gay people off of roofs. I mean, I've heard all of these things from people who are serious. Okay, so hold on. Those, are, those, those are two different things. Let's, I know, but I'm just, just running a, through the different uh, talking points. But yeah, we can do one at a time. Let's, let's, let's talk about the Jewish thing first. Yeah. I don't know if I can process all that. So much garbage at one point. Um, so the way to deal with racism is through teaching tolerance not through taking a group of people who are sub subjected to racism and allow them now to become the racists. Best example for that is the fact that the vast majority of Holocaust survivors, the very people who survived this you know, nightmare of, of, of genocide in Europe, did not go to Palestine. Mm. Only a very small fraction, and many went back. And I actually, in the process with a friend of mine, making a little documentary about... Um, 
this wonderful uh, Belgian Jew called Jacques Boudet. Uh, did he die? No. No, no, he's, no, no. Okay. he's okay. Oh, that's amazing. He's alive and well, thank God. Oh, he's okay. turning 90. And he, uh, he's a adamantly anti-Zionist. Wow. And he was brought as a young man. He was 17 or something. Because the Zionists took all the, all the orphans and just forced them. He didn't want to go. He was in an orphanage. Uh, still hoping that perhaps his, his parents would return, but his parents were taken and, 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 and killed. And he had no choice. And he said, wait, uh, social workers, he said, I don't want to go. I'm, I don't want, I want to go. I want to go back home. They said, no, you have to go. And then wow. you know, while, so he was there in this period of the early 1950s, 49 to 52. And you hear very little about that. And he hated every minute of it. And he said, you know, the, the way they treated first the Holocaust survivors was horrific. The Zionists treated them like dirt and because they didn't fight and because it was their right. fault, because they were not Zionists. And blah, blah, blah. so it, almost like, you know, they kind of had it coming and he couldn't take it and he couldn't stand it and fight. And he had to serve in the army and he refused absolutely to serve in the army. And it's interesting. He describes the city of Yaffa of Majdal, where is now the city of Ashkelon near Gaza. He says the cities were empty. He said, empty ghost towns these enormous cities you know arabs were gone everybody was thrown out and he said then they sent us to you know try to do something to to, to you know really he managed to work get some money forge buy some you know documents and get the hell out and he's very outspoken but the story of the holocaust survivors is that the vast majority did not go because the solution and he says this too and of course this is true the solution for racism is education hmm. It's tolerance, taking Jews and putting them in Palestine and, 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 and creating this apartheid regime, of course, is nothing. That is how you create space. Now, I heard a conversation here in, in near Washington, D.C., in, in Tacoma Park, which is a city uh, near Washington. There was, a, there, was a, there was a kind of a Palestine event there, and it was packed. Uh, and, and a great you know, friend, Palestinian, Tahir Zala from AMP, was on the panel. And at the very end of a very, very kind of, you know, very dramatic and uh, tense uh, event, this old Jewish guy went up to ask a question. Now, the guy lives in, in America. I don't know if he was born there, but he lives in a very wealthy community and he's got his children live here and he has got nothing to do with Palestine. And he asked this Palestinian, Tahir, exactly what you just asked. Don't Jews deserve a place to call their own where they can be safe? Now, are Jews not safe in Tacoma Park? Jews are completely safe here. You know what I mean? Jews have never been, nobody's ever been, you know. Um, and Tahir looks at him and he goes, I got four words for you. Not at my expense. And it was a knockout, you know. That was kind of the last moment, the last statement, the last moment of the event. You know, I mean, Jews don't feel safe somewhere and they want to leave. They can leave, but you're not going to go somewhere, take somebody else's land and say, well, I have a right to live here because over there I don't feel safe. You know, it's such, it's such a, I don't know, it, it, something so patronizing and, and, and unbelievably, um, uh, I don't know, the sense of, of, of this, uh, we have a right to go there because blah, 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 whatever. We might not feel comfortable here, so we want to know that there's a place over there we can go to. I'm sorry, that's not how it works. You know, I, you know black Americans feel safe. Right. If people, you know, talk to black Americans that have a young son. A teenage age son, they're horrible. They're terrified every time you know a boy or a girl go you know pulled over for for a speeding ticket. You know th that's not the issue. The issue, that's not the way you resolve racism. Sure, there's racism. There's always racism, and, and anti-Semitism is part of this racist reality that America lives exists in. You have to teach tolerance. You deal with it through education, not through separate colonialism. Mm. Um, yeah. So on the other question, the other question with Hamas. I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I think uh, Benjamin Netanyahu killed more people and is responsible for more innocent death than Hamas will in a thousand years. And to be quite honest, that's another thing that I wrote about in, in Justice in my second book. In the 1990s, um, when Netanyahu was prime minister, actually, the late 90s, um, there were there's a lot of a lot of civilian deaths. I mean, the the, the suicide bombing, the buses were being blown up. It was horrible. That's the that's when my niece was killed in '97. And Ahmed Yassin, who was the founder and the head of Hamas at the time, was in prison. And the Israelis came to him. The 
Israeli intelligence and said, could you please ask your people to stop targeting civilians? And he said, and it's documented, I will sign an agreement now to stop targeting civilians if both sides agree. If both sides agree, if the Israelis will agree, we will stop, we, if the, we all stop targeting civilians. Israelis never came back. Wow. Israelis never came back. Because Palestinians have never had a military. I mean, they've had groups of, of, of guerrilla fighters, but they've never had a tank. They've never had a warplane. They've never had a, a military. So all there is is to kill civilians, really. And when Israel bombs Gaza, we talked about that earlier, or when they kill you know, everywhere else. So the Israelis never came back. So to blame Hamas for being the problem is hypocrisy. I mean, Hamas is a small group, a small political party, a particular movement within a hugely political world of the Palestinian, of the, you know, the very large and very diverse political uh, world of Palestine or Palestinians. When Palestine is free, when Palestinians are free to run for office, when Palestinians are released from prison, all the thousands and thousands, many of them are political, I mean, they're all political prisoners, but many of them are political leaders. You know, you'll have Hamas and you'll have communists and you'll have everything in between. And of course, you're going to have, you know, hopefully Netanyahu will be in, 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 in jail for war crimes, but there'll be others. And then people vote for whoever they want to vote for. But to blame Hamas, to say Hamas is the problem, right. is outrageous. It's this, oh, it's so much, the argument being like, it's so much better this way. Than for it who? would be for who? Yeah, for who? Who's guaranteeing the safety of Palestinians? You know, they talk about the wall when they built the wall. They said, "Oh, this is to prevent suicide bombing. This is to prevent, you know, is deaths of Israelis." But it didn't. It didn't prevent Israelis going and killing Palestinians at all. It didn't. It didn't protect Palestinians from Israeli violence. So what's the point? Mm -hmm. Uh, last question, because thank you. You've been so generous with your time, and I could ask. I have so many questions, but. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, limit myself. Um, a lot of people say that, you know, Israeli Arabs have it great. They live so well. The people in Gaza and um, the West Bank, it's different. But the people who are actually uh, citizens have it great. And there's no discrimination. And they're doctors and lawyers. And uh, uh, Nura addressed this a little bit. But I just wanted you to give people a sense of what the reality is, how this discrimination manifests itself among that population. Well, first of all, it's not true because very often Palestinians in the West Bank live much better than Palestinian citizens of Israel. The conditions of the citizens of Israel is horrendous. The conditions are horrendous. I'm talking about lack of water, lack of roads, lack of infrastructure, lack of safety. Uh, violent crime, all that kind of stuff. You know, the police don't go in when there's violent crime in Palestinian communities. The police don't go in unless a Jew is killed or hurt. If Arabs are killing Arabs, nobody cares. And it's a huge problem. It's an enormous problem. A good friend of mine, Bilal uh, Youssef, just made an, wrote an incredible documentary called Living um, uh, Life in the Shadow of Death. About, about this issue and, and, and the complicity of the state of Israel with... Um, with the criminal elements within within Palestinian society in 1948, Palestinians, you know, you can buy an M16, kill somebody in broad daylight in any of the Palestinian towns, in in you know, in what they call Israel, and you're never going to get nothing's going to happen. No one's going to come in. The police are not going to come. You know, you can call the police. Sometimes they do, but they never bother. And none of the cases that were investigated were they were ever solved. You know, and very few are actually investigated. So, I mean, that's, you know, to give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, so in many ways, in many ways, the conditions in some of the, in, in a lot of the West Bank are much better than uh, the conditions within, within the state of Israel. Um, I mean, I don't know, where, where do you want to start? You want to start talk about water. Um, yeah, you want to talk about, uh, again, infrastructure, roads, safety, housing. I was in, I talked earlier about the city of Lid, and there's a wonderful member of the city council of Lid, Fidash Hadeh. Uh, her English is not great, but I think she'd be a great person to interview. She's brilliant. Um, and she, is a, she grew up in Lids, and she's looking around her, and she's noticing that there's no infrastructure going into Palestinian neighborhoods. And there's 40% of the Palestinian of the population are Palestinian. So she went and studied city planning and then ran for office, and she is a member of the city council. 
And last year in 2021, when the big uprising took place, she was, you know, her voice was, was really incredible. It was really important and came to prominence. And she drives the, the, the mayor, who's a settler, a racist settler, and, and, this, and the rest of the city establishment nuts. Because she, you know, she points out. Um, and the settler violence there is terrible. Even though this is supposedly Israel, they bring settlers in, hundreds of settlers, and the horrible stuff. But, um, you know, I was just with her. I was there in August. And uh, we went to one of the Palestinian neighborhoods, what's called unrecognized neighborhoods. So the state doesn't recognize them. Even though we're talking about thousands of people. Um, no water, no roads, no light, no electricity, uh, no garbage collection. And the city is building new housing, beautiful housing for settlers. So the settler community, what they call the, the, religion, the national religious community, which is a very particular type of religious Jews who are, who are the settlers in the West Bank. So they build housing for them. Um, but they don't call it that necessarily, always. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So the, this, uh, these two Palestinian brothers went to sign up, to, you know, because they said you can come and sign up and get an apartment to qualify. And they qualified. I mean, there's no reason why they couldn't. And when they came, they were told, sorry, it's already full. So one of them went back and asked his boss, who was an Israeli Jew, to go and see. So he went in to sign up. And they said, oh, yeah, we got lots of apartments. Well, how many bedrooms do you want? You know, pick, pick the apartment you want. He said, wait a minute, you just told my Palestinian employee that there are no housing. And the girl said, well, what do you want from me? You know, if I let Palestinian, if we let Palestinians live here, then everybody's going to go. No one's going to want, no one's going to buy. We can't let Palestinian Arabs live here. They don't say Palestinians, they call them Arabs. Yeah. You know, so housing, infrastructure, of course. I'll give you another example. House demolitions. In the Naqab, alone, which is the southern part of the country. Some 300,000 Palestinian citizens of Israel live. Uh, over the last five years, there's about 2,000 homes were just demolished per year. Per year, in the last five years, 2,500 per year on average. Um, in the rest of 1948 Palestine, in other words, Israel proper, what they call, there are some 40,000 home demolition orders. Jerusalem has something like 18,000 home demolition orders on the books. And many Palestinians will say, I'd rather they come and demolish the home than have this demolition order, you know, of, uh, over my head. Looming. How many of these demolition orders do you think are for Jewish homes, Israeli homes? Zero? Yeah, zero. Now, is it possible that only Palestinians build without a permit? Because many... Right. Well, most of the time they say they built without a permit. I know people who had a balcony and closed it off and created a room. I know a lot of, you know, people do it all the time without a permit. They built. If, if an inspector shows up, he writes a report, maybe gives them a fine. They go to court a couple of years later, then a couple more years later, they go to court again. Then they appeal. You never ever see the army close off a street, bring in, or the police, if it's within Israel, uh, within 1948, Palestine, and, then, and bring in bulldozers and demolish a home. You never see that, not even once. It never happens. Only to Palestinians. Is it possible that only Palestinians build without a permit and Israelis never, I mean, is it possible? And we're talking about tens of thousands of home demolitions going on all the time. Is it possible that Israeli, this never happens. So, I mean, whichever way you look at it, and of course you can look at the books, you can look at the law books, dozens of, of, of laws that specifically discriminate against Palestinians. And of course the most famous one is the, is the nation state law. Oh my God, yeah. Basically. But if you look at the very beginning, look at the very first laws that were passed by the Knesset that define citizenship, that define the state. You know, a Jewish state, this is, what, what does that mean when you have a population of Palestinians? The fact that Palestinians can't return. And Jews have, like you said earlier, to Nura, Jews can go, and so on and on, so and on and on and on and on and on. And so this argument that somehow life for the citizens, Palestinian citizens of Israel is good in any, by, by any by any by any measure, and they are they represent the largest percentage of of the poor citizens among the citizens of the state of Israel, um, and their living conditions are horrific. Mm. Absolutely live in terror. Because, and again, Nora touched on this, she, you know, initially the Palestinians within 1948 were placed in a mil under military rule. Right. 
And in 66, they took away the military role, but they replaced it with the secret police, the Shabak. So the Shabak governs their lives, applying for a job, applying for school, applying for a driver's license. The Shabak is involved in everything. This is the intelligence services that apply. Israelis don't know this because it's invisible. Right. It's not like a military that you see. The Shabak is kind of in, in the shadows. The Palestinians know this. So it's, it's, a, it's a complete lie. It's a, it's a complete fallacy. One more question that we got from the audience, which is um, how do you successfully ask a dominant group to peacefully give up advantages over a dominated group? You don't. You can't. It's not going to happen. It has to be struggle. It has to be a struggle. We need to stand with the Palestinians in their struggle and, and we need to uh, amplify it, particularly in the United States. We need to demand sanctions, severe sanctions. We need to demand that Israeli diplomats be sent home. We need to demand that American diplomat, diplomatic missions close. We need to demand that not a single dime, not a single bullet go to Israel. The, we need to demand that Israel be uh, banned from the Olympics, banned from the World Cup, banned from academic uh, spaces, banned from cultural spaces. There cannot be, they cannot allow any Israeli representation in any international forum. There have to be severe sanctions and we have to stand with the Palestinian resistance um, 110% and support them and stop calling them terrorists and stop calling them all these, all these crazy names because they are not the terrorists. They are freedom fighters 100%, whether they engage in armed resistance or unarmed resistance, whatever the case may be. You know, these are brave freedom fighters and we need to stand with them and we need to have their back and that is how we bring this racist society on its, to its knees, and that's how it collapses. It doesn't happen peacefully. You know, uh, I just finished reading a great book about Joe Slovo and Ruth First, who, you know, after Mandela, Winnie and Nelson Mandela, they were the second kind of, they were the, 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 the second couple of, of the apartheid, anti-apartheid movement. By the way, they're both Jewish. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, you know, Joe Slovo was the chief of staff of the armed resistance of the ANC, you know? You cannot defeat a racist uh, society. You cannot defeat a racist apartheid regime um, by hoping that they will one day wake up and feel good that, that they want to do the right thing. It never happens. You have to be. You have to support resistance. You have to demand sanctions, and we have to do it. Uh, you know, as clearly, unapologetically, and uncompromisingly as possible. It's up to us. Hmm. That's perfect way to end this. Um, I will, I have to read one super chat and I feel really bad ending it on this cause this is not about me, but I just want to thank firmware where it's Katie, your courage at the Hill has launched a minor firestorm of change It is incremental. But I think when the history is written, your video essay will be seen to have been a positive inflection point in bringing justice to Palestine. Thank you. Absolutely. And nice. I stand with what Nora said about, uh, about you earlier as well. Um, oh. so thank you Thanks. for, I, you know, for your courage, for saying the right thing, for doing, making, you you know, doing do, these but... shows, for doing these things, you know, don't underestimate the importance of this, of your voice and the importance of what you work. Do not underestimate no, it. This is you. really, really important. Well, you and Nuda are obviously totally different level of bravery and, um, advocacy. So I thank you guys. So that means a lot from you. And also we should tell people, well, people want to know how they can find out more about you and support you. And then we should we can tease that event right on the thirtieth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the tenth anniversary of my book, The General's Son, uh, we put out a special edition that's coming out. We're going to be doing events throughout the country. Um, we have a documentary that we created as well, so we're going to show a little clip of that, got a little teaser, a seven-minute teaser uh, from that documentary. Um, and uh, we're going to kick off in Washington, D.C. on October 30th at Bus Boys and Poets on K Street. And you're coming, right? You confirmed? Yes. Yeah. So Katie and I are going to sit and have a conversation about Palestine, about the book, about all kinds of different things. Um, and so that's coming up. And then we're going to be throughout the country. If you go to micopella.com or you can go to Patreon uh, uh, or Miko Pellet slash Patreon or whatever. You can, there's tons Probably of Probably patreon.com slash Miko Pellet. Thank you. Patreon.com slash Miko Pellet, yeah. Thank you. And so there's tons of, tons of content uh, that uh, we're putting out all the time. So yeah, thanks for mentioning that. So please uh, feel free to 
uh, go there, support it, read the stuff, look at the stuff, um, engage. It's I think I think more important than anything is share it with people who are not part of no. the you know the, the choir. We're not part right. of the, our little circle. Share it, share it, share it. Tell people to listen. Tell people to read. It's really really important to expand the circle. We have to expand the circle. Yeah, and I will. Um, I'm. It's my new gift. Uh, like my go-to gift to give people is that book. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Well, Miko, thank you so much. And thank you so much to everyone. I'm going to be on Colin now. So I'll take your calls on Colin. Um, and again, we'll put in the link, but I'll be in DC with Miko on October 30th at Busboys and Poets. Um, not sure what time it is. Do you know what time it is? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, again, please like this stream. If you're watching right now and you haven't already, just like it. Also, please subscribe. You just hit subscribe and then you hit the bell. And if you can afford to, then you, of course, can become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And I think I'm doing a special extra stream on Thursday. Uh, that will be in two days. So check in. Uh, check my Twitter or we'll, we'll make a post of it uh, at YouTube. Again, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Miko, and best of luck to you. And we will Thanks. see you again soon because we're going to make that a, another Katie Helper Show uh, stream. Great. Okay. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Okay, calm down. You got rivers, man. You got rivers.